Big Jim, here we are. Now, there isn't a podcast, um, or a rugby pod, I should say, out at the moment because you guys are on a bit of a Christmas break. So I feel it's my responsibility to say, how's your week been? Hold the fort, exactly. How's the week been? No change to how it is, naturally, when we do the rugby pod. A carnage every week. Uh, we just spoke about it, didn't we, just before we went live or press record, as it were, in these Zoom days of recording podcasts. Uh, we just chatted about it, weren't we? It's not the American dream. It's uh, as much as we want it to be, and we want it to be Christmas carols and round the fire and singing songs and a calm house. It's far from it. It's absolute bedlam. It's 20 past eight. We just said 50% of the kids have just gone down and uh, we get a bit of time to ourselves. So in answer to your question, Bedlam, if we just leave it, leave that one word out there for how my week's been. And it's only, it's Wednesday. It's Wednesday, mate. When you text me saying, mate, can we push it back to 20 past eight? I was delighted because I was scrambling. I still had two kids up. I think Abby's still in bed with one of them. There was a chance that I was about to fall asleep in bed with Rocky. Um, so it's, it's just, it's a mental time of year. And even wrapping presents, it's relentless, isn't it? It's just relentless. And well, you- I wouldn't know about the wrapping presents or not at that point. I think the big thing is, at the minute, I think that we're all feeling is we're not sitting ducks, aren't we? I know you've been through the COVID stuff with the kids and the isolation. You know, yeah. touch wood, we don't... Well, we might have had it at the start, like a lot of people have said, but it's almost like now, with the kids being back at school or just finishing up from school and coming into Christmas, like we're like sitting ducks as well. So there's that anxiety around what's already anxiety around Christmas anyway, making sure that everything's done. And as many of the listeners and and viewers will be in the same position as us, won't they? The more people in your household, the the bigger chances of something going wrong. So not that we're trying to put a downer or try not to stay positive. There's almost a bit of realism around everything that's going on now that it's uh, you're battling on many fronts, I think, trying to make sure that you get everything wrapped for Christmas. Get it wrapped for Christmas, the politics of who you're having on Christmas Day, who you're meeting on Boxing Day, the family dynamics, everything. It's all it all comes to a head on the 25th. It's um it's all upon us, mate. But listen to this one. You know that you want the kids to be good and well behaved and on the good list come Christmas Day. My middle boy Hunter, uh Tuesday night, I go up and have a look at my phone. It was charging in my bedroom, and I've got a missed call from the police. And I'm thinking, oh God phoned them back hello is that Alan I said yes what's happened and he said nothing nothing we've had three missed calls we've had three calls to the police station to 999 this evening Um, and we heard boys laughing in the background I was like oh god I'm so sorry have you ever had that Jim you ever had that the panic that set in through me but it was Hunter admitted it he said daddy I phoned the police oh my god I've, I've, I've had the police turn up at the house looking for me when I was when I was a youngster, <laughs> but no, I haven't had that. So I'll try and keep the phone away from them. Actually, JJ's at the point now where what he wants to phone he's ten, um, but that is the worry, isn't it? Because you've got that button on the side of your phone as well, haven't you? The old emergency SOS. Yeah. So if if they hold it too long, no, we've not had the police round, but look, you know, boys will be boys and all that, and it's probably that. They're coming round at some point, I imagine. So (laughs) by hook or by crook, and hopefully it's not for ringing them, Nashi, but the old technology, eh? That's what it is. The boys, he he heard 999 at school, so he knew the numbers, he knew the buttons. He's only six. And he said, I just kept hitting it, Daddy, and then the man answered, and he did it three times. Um, The guilt that sets in when the police officer phones you and checks that everything's okay. I mean, that was a a shocker. On the Christmas week, when I'm all we're doing is saying, be good, let's get to Christmas Eve, you're still on the good list, and he and he throws that curveball in. God, how you, I mean, dealing with that, you start you start unwrapping his presents when he pulls out one like that. <laughs> well, we are still believers in our house all the way from top to bottom. So that's we've good. we've got the yeah we've got the Father Christmas. If you're not good, still hanging over them. The romance of Christmas, which we love, the spirit of Christmas should I say. So we have got that card. Not that it works, because either way, as you know, mate, Santa's coming regardless, isn't it? Like, you can tell him a million times that if you don't be good, or you ring the police, Santa ain't coming. He's coming, isn't he? Like, he's coming with a vengeance, because we've got nothing else to look forward to at the minute. That's it, mate. Totally agree. Totally agree. But, Jim, we're here. It's Doddy Aid. It's round the corner. Um, You are leading the Barbarians with Gabby Logan. 
how are things going? Obviously, a lot of chat, a lot of infrastructure behind the scenes, but how is it steering the, stri- the ship for the Barbarians? It's frustrating, actually, if I'm honest. Not getting the love that I thought from the fellow Barbarians. I, I don't know whether Gabby's going down the, the higher in the profile, the more that she'll give you a shout out. She's aligning herself with Foxy, with Jason Fox. Oh. I'm the bloody manager. I'm steering this ship. <laughs> like, I'm the front, I'm, I'm the lead. And she's not mentioned me once. So, but it is great to have her on board, I'll be honest. And Foxy as well. They are significantly more famous than me. I'm probably more well suited to try and get the numbers up. So, I did my bit last year. Uh, we did well. I can't remember where we came. I know we didn't win it, but we, we were close. Uh, but yeah, to have Gabby as captain, I'm manager now, I should say. Oh, okay. Captain sounds better. But I'm manager, and with that comes admin, and I hate admin. So I'm probably not doing my job right, to be honest. So I'm happy for Gabby not to name drop me. But that's just, as you know, as everyone knows who's listening, it's come back around. It's come back around fairly quickly as well. It feels crazy that it's been a year. I know, you know, I'm stating what a lot of people are saying. It's been the slowest yet, the quickest year in terms of not a lot's happened, but so much has happened, if you know what I mean, in the outside world. And I think... One of the things which gave everyone a kind of boost, especially myself, our house and people that we're associated with, was after the Christmas blues and everything that we went through last year collectively, you know, as human beings, the Doddy Aid in January, and you were a big part of that as well in terms of um, the podcast that you held throughout that day and some of the people you spoke to. And once you get through all the kind of administrative stuff that needs to get done that poor Rob Wainwright is getting through and you actually go on that journey, not just as someone that's, I'd say heavily involved, but quite involved. And you actually go along the journey and see the amount of people that are involved and the amount of people that have been affected either emotionally by the story or engaged by the story, uh, raising money, uh, you know, the mental health aspect of training and being a part of something, the physical well-being. You know, when we got to the end of January, and we raised the money that we did. I think everyone, whether or not it was a small part or a large part, felt a part of something really special. And I've always said it, even before Doddy's diagnosis, you know, he had the power to do that. There's not many people that can do that, that can bring people together, inspire people, make them laugh, make them enjoy what they're doing. There's not many people in the world that can do that. Doddy's one of them. And through his... Um, his illness and the troubles that he's going through, he's done that again. So we are back again for the second year. Naturally, we're going to want to top it. Uh, you look at what Kevin Sinfield's done. We had him on our uh, on our podcast. And then people just drive you and inspire you. Yeah. And already we've got more people involved than as we know. And look, we're starting early. You know, you were doing your podcast well into the Doddy stuff. You're starting it before this year because the appetite's there to, for people to raise the profile that we're either doing it like myself and you had Davey on or whether we've got new members you know like Gabby uh, and Kenny uh, just to name two there's obviously thousands of other people involved uh, that saw it were kind of involved but not really that now want to be involved so we're here again and I can't wait it's going to be class as soon as it finished last year it was already it was spoken about immediately about I can't wait for this year, you know, let's get it, let's get it going, get it set up. And obviously, as you mentioned there, Rob Wainwright, Mark Beaumont do, does a lot in the background where you touched on their world in a day um, for that big event on the 29th of January. But you, you nailed it there, Jim, when you said the way people come together for Doddy and for what this charity means and how it's developed so quickly with the funding that's now come from the government. And hearing stories like Davy Jev that I had on this week, the Edinburgh team captain, I mean, heartbreaking but inspiring at the same time and what he's going through and what he has to face on a daily basis and how is the condition is taking over his body, but he just keeps going and he doesn't look too far ahead and he, he achieves something and he keeps going and he does it all now for his little boy, his family, his twin brother, his, his, his extended family. And we're hearing these stories and obviously through the podcast and each district's got a podcast this year. Um, and we're going to get more and more of behind the scenes of what's going on within the foundation the Dory foundation but also how the thousands of people that get involved from the first of january how it's the experiences are affecting them because that's what's so epic about this and as you say i remember last year speaking on world in a day to people from all over the world and that's the power of rugby and the power of Dory. 
that he brings people from all walks of life. Yeah, absolutely. And I knew a little bit about Davey's story. And then in the world of the day, he was obviously there the whole time. Uh, his brother was involved. And you start to, even though it was bizarre, because even though we were over Zoom, you did feel a connection with people. I, You know, I was in my garage. I was jumping in and out. You know, Ali McCoy was on his bike. And it was just a kind of really surreal thing that was happening because you felt a part of it. Do you know what I mean? You felt a part of their story and you felt like you were together. I think that that, like you mentioned, is the power of Doddy. I think there's almost a human kind of um, element to it in terms of you become a product of your environment. So we're all probably a little bit used to being on Zoom, but it gave a lot of people that kind of release. And it's like anything. It's like when you read an inspirational story, um, you know, you watch Kevin Sinfield and what he's done and you watch the documentaries around anything, but if we're talking about Doddy and, and, and the documentaries that have been released this year around Doddy and, and the features that we've seen, you know, Jen Beatty, uh, Johnny's uh, sister, yeah. and John, Johnny Beatty Sr., uh, you know, you're watching that Spotty Award. It's easy to go through life and just go through life. Do you know what I mean? And, and the, the, the natural things in life, it's busy, it's tough, there's ups and downs naturally. But stuff like this gives us all moments to kind of stop, reflect, and also be energised by some of the stories that we hear. And yes, you're right. They are incredibly sad and harrowing. And on the flip side of that, the way that people like Davey and the way that Doddy and the way that Rob Burrow and Kevin Sinfield, in terms of what he, he's done to raise awareness and raise money, and also the My Name's Doddy Foundation, the people involved in that, and then the people supporting that, you can't help but just be inspired. Like, it's just... It's one of them things that it's just one of them things in life where if you see it, read it, you're a part of it, it inspires you and it gives you a lift. It gives you an energy, uh, which we all need. Yeah. You know, whether or not we're going through MND or whether or not we're going through a down point in our life or whether or not we just potter through life as okay on an equal, on an equal level. So, yeah, no, Davey's story, absolutely phenomenal. What a, an unbelievable human being as well. Yeah, and, and touching on the Kevin Sinfield story and what he's done for Rob Burroughs, I take it you've watched the, the documentary on YouTube. And Yeah, yeah, I and, watched it, yeah. And when he when he gives Rob a cuddle in the stadium, once he runs in at the end, mm. I mean, the, the emotion, that doing that for his teammate, doing that for his best mate, turning up, putting the miles and going through the dark hours in the middle of the night, what he's done, and you, the, the podcast you did with him, you and Goody, it was brilliant, but what a humble guy. And people are just stepping up to do these things for their mates, for their teammates, for, for people that need it. Give us a bit on Kevin Sinfield from your, your point of view for what he's done in putting MND on the map. Well, I don't know the guy personally. Uh, probably similar to Doddy. He's a guy that I looked up to when I was a youngster and I was watching Rugby League, Boots and All, and when Rugby League was, it, it, was, it felt like it was a lot bigger back then, maybe because I watched it back then. You know, Leeds... St. Helens, Wigan, you know, yeah. just to name the kind of three big ones, what it was when I watched it then. And he was a player that I used to watch and he was phenomenal then. Um, and then obviously we saw with Rob Burrow and how sad his story was. And then out of that came light. And in that light, leading it was Kevin Sinfield in terms of running, was it seven marathons in seven days? It was something last year raised a ridiculous amount of money and not only did that to raise money, but raised the awareness alongside yeah. the My Name Doddy Foundation. And naturally, I think what happens with these exceptional human beings, these special people, is one isn't enough. It's like you think, right, you've done that, Kev. Unbelievable. Job done. But it, it wasn't. It was like, right, what's next? And we saw that with the extra mile and if the listeners and the viewers haven't seen it, it's on YouTube, so it's free. It's called The Extra Mile. And I was the same as you. Like, I mean, you see it's all jolly at the start. The Extra Mile is basically 101 miles in 24 hours. So from Leicester Tigers training ground all the way up to Leeds, um, Rhinos where, where they play. It's 101 miles in 24 hours. And it all starts off great. You know, everyone's smiling, the sun's shining in Leicester. And then you can see, and even, like, I wouldn't be able to do it myself, but you can, like, you can just see as the stages go naturally, it's getting more and more difficult. But it's the darkness, I think. Yeah. I think it's when it, and this is what we said to Kev. I think it, the, but you know, the, 
the perspective I got from it and watching it was when it got dark and they were further up north. I don't know whether it was Rotherham because it's not an amazing spot to be in. But, uh, you know, I, I imagine the darkness was a big part of it. And we spoke about that. And at that point was when his Leeds teammates joined and him and Rob's teammates joined and they were talking and they were singing and they were sharing stories. And it was just, again, the power of one man two men, if you include Rob's story, which is obviously the reason why, the power of them two to bring the amount of people that they did together and the money, which is obviously so important, but also the profile and also to inspire other people as well to get up and do things and to be better. And that's what I took from Kevin Sinfield was that he is a special human being. There's no doubt about that, but he's normal. Like he's a normal bloke doing exceptional things, he, you know, and he's coaching Leicester as well. And there's no, you know, there's no coincidence that Leicester are top of the table unbeaten this season. Like you can, you, you can marry it up however you want and, and, and look at it or whatever, but um, it's because of him, in my opinion. And, and yes, there'll be some other factors, but if you've got someone like him in your squad, quite a quiet guy, quite an assuming guy, but by all accounts, how can you complain? How can you not want to make 100 tackles a game for him? So there's a number of layers, different layers to it, but you know that Kevin Sinfield is another one of them exceptional, special human beings, and it was a pleasure to you know be able to spend 20, 30 minutes virtually with him the other week. Yeah, incredible guy. And stay on Leicester, Jim, obviously a club that you know really well, but... How happy are you to see kind of, kind of a Leicester of old? You know, they, they go away from home, they, they defend Welford Road and they're just playing great rugby, but they're grinding out wins. Is that, you, you pleased to see that in your old club? Oh, mate, it's class. I, look, I feel, I'm buzzing at the minute. You know, hashtag always Edinburgh doing well. Yeah. Uh, Gloucester are doing really well. Saracens are back in the Prem and Leicester, my first club, they're smashing it. And you actually look at the profile of their team, like they haven't got an amazing squad. Like in terms of like some of the other teams that you look around, but clearly well coached. Um, I still think they're the biggest club in in England in terms of fans. In terms like I mean, if you go based on looking at social media numbers and you speak to BT Sport in terms of if 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 a club's playing, who's the most watched? It's Leicester, uh, and that's because of the foundations that were set in there years ago with Martin Johnson and Neil Back and Ben Kay and you know Cockrell and Garforth and Roundtree and just to name a few, just like a few of them lads playing. But yeah, it's great. I think rugby, having a strong Leicester Tigers team is significantly better for it. European rugby, the fact that they, they're two from two in Europe as well to go to Bordeaux, who top top of the top 14 and win. And a large part of that is the culture. And Kevin Sinfield's a part of that. Steve Borthwick, obviously, is an unassuming character, probably, very different to me, I imagine. Uh, but nonetheless, doing fantastic things. And yeah, I think it's class to see. Were you supply, pr- surprised to see Genji signing for Bristol? Or not at all because Very. of the club? Were you? Were you? Mate, when you look at it, you, you're captain. You made captain. I, I, look, I've been captain of Gloucester and I left, but there was a few things underneath that why I left. It was, there was a load of changes going. It wasn't a very settled club. You know, Genji's play, playing better than ever. Um made captain of Leicester and like I just said the biggest club in England and top of the league Bristol are struggling you know they said it weren't about money I think I think there's more to it I think they're probably there probably is something to do with money I don't I don't know that but I imagine I imagine it is it's almost like they've they've made a point in saying that like Pat Lang came out and said it's not to do with money which makes me think well it clearly is then but it, it is where he's from. There was talk of him going to Saracens uh, with Maka Vunapola potentially leaving. I would have liked to, if, if, if there was any club that I would have liked to see them go to, I, I think it would have been Saracens because of the way that they play. And I think Genji's a class player and I think that he can kick on. They've been getting hosed in the scrum Bristol. So you've got to be careful with, again, I'm just going based on experience. I really like Alice Genji. He's, he's, he's a good lad, played against him when he was a uh, young testosterone fueled bull. And I was on my way out and uh, knew he was going to be pretty good. But you seem to be careful, you know, in terms of going from top of the league at Leicester as captain and the profile that brings to go in, which I think is a backward step. And I love the way that Bristol play, going to Bristol for money or not money, however you look at it. 
and with it with a World Cup two years and a Lions tour, obviously after that, because I think he's got the potential to to be a success at both. But we will see. I mean, it's interesting times for rugby at the minute because budgets have been cut. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So you don't know how Leicester's books look. I know that I just said they haven't got a high profile team, but I don't know how much some of the guys are getting paid. You know, to lose George Ford and Ellis Gaines, Gaines, two of your best players and two of your highest paid players, makes me think that the books aren't balanced at Leicester and they probably were fairly willing to let him leave. That was a good uh, rumour that you put out that Finn might have been getting drafted into Leicester. Where do you think Finn could go if if his time at racing does come to an end? Where do you think is a club that, that could take him on and, and deal with that flair? Well... I did hit Tom Tune and ask you, we've got Jim and Tony. It's late. Um, he is, as we know, a fantastic player. He's not suited to a Leicester, right? And I know there was there was definitely talks going on. There must have been, because if they didn't get Andre Pollard, the next person I think that potentially might be looking is Finn Russell. Leicester have got the right person in terms of how they want to play with Andre Pollard. So we are chatting about it on our podcast and you know, you know what people like to come back at you and stuff like that. You're talking rubbish. Well, probably am, but I kind of know a little bit. But yeah, I think Finn, I'd like to see him stay in Paris. I think that how he's come on at Racing, the Paris scene fits the Maverick player that we all love in him. You know, the story that goes with it. I mean, no disrespect if we were to name a Connor or a Newport or, I don't know, a Poe in France. You know, not that these places aren't glitz and glamour, but you, you think Finn Russell, you think... A Saracens, or you think a Paris, or even a Stade Francais, if you go across the city there, you think of a big kind of glitz and glamour club. I think he'll stay at, at, at Racing. Um, I could see him maybe doing a sabbatical in Japan. That's where the big money is. That's where a lot of the players are going now. Uh, you see them going to Japan because there's, there's less games. It's easier there, and it's easy it's easy coin. And we know that Finn likes a bit of coin, doesn't he? Because he's got flash cars. I'm sure he's got some nice watches as well. Could you see him at Leinster? What if Sexton came to an end and they wanted a big high profile 10 with the, sort of their winning mentality? Interesting. Interesting because, again, I did hear whispers of Leinster. I heard real murmurings of Munster. I think Ireland probably like to keep, especially in such a key position, someone at Irish because they, they, they need... They need that position. I think in Ireland, you look at the profile of some of the other players that they've got. Obviously, James Lowe is probably a, a bit of an anomaly there on the wing, but it's more forwards and stuff like that where you can't breed South Africans well, anywhere in the world, really, can you? Apart from South Africa or or the Netherlands back in the day. So, And that's the kind of players that you need to bring, be like, actually, we need to bring these in or, you know, a Kiwi, we need to bring someone like that in that can add a different balance to it. Lens, I'd love to see him at Leinster. He'd suit that, wouldn't he? Been in Dublin, yeah. best club in Europe, you could say. Uh, Toulouse, I, I can't think who their 10 is at the minute. Um, they've signed, they've signed a boy from La Rochelle. Toulouse, but... Toulouse is uh, Michelac, is it not? Not Michelac. Um, oh, no. no um... Intermac. Intermac, that's it. Yeah, but he, I think he wants to play twelve. From what I'm, from what I'm saying. But, Imagine um, that du, Dupont, Finn, and Intermac. Imagine that. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, you know, you could see a Toulouse as well. So, but I think Finn's quality. What I do like about Scotland now, though, is is there's more to Scotland than Finn Russell. Um, I say that in a way in which it's it's class for Scotland in terms of their growth. You know, it's not just the Finn Russell show, and it hasn't been probably for the last year, which is great. Absolutely, but what about Hoggy? Have you seen the post he's just put out? Is that because it's contract time and, and all that sort of stuff? You see that this evening? What? No, I've not been on my phone this evening. He, Alan, what did he say? He put out... Here, I'll get it here. Oh, no, hold on, I've put this off. It's that he's committing to... Away from all the rumours and things like that, he's committing to Exeter. Um, His family and everyone is settled and that's what he's doing. So people are saying, well, it's that time of the season, it's that time of the contract. You've got to let people know that you're maybe looking for a move or you're wanting to re-sign. Further to recent speculation about my future, I'm happy to say that I will be honouring my contract at Exeter and I'm massively excited about the future. My family and I are very settled and keen to win more titles. Is that the sort of post you put out? I think if you're as high profile as Hoggy and the way that the world is now on social media, yeah, potentially. I, I didn't hear there was many rumours about. Maybe not me 
finger on the pulse for the last few days because it's been bedlam. But I'm just looking. He's 29. You know, Hoggy's 29. Just Wikipedia, that if that's true, he looks about 50. But <laughs> he, um, so he's now, I would say, in his peak and maybe the far side of his peak. He's probably got two or three really good years. And look, I say two or three really good years, as in Stuart Hogg years, world-class, as in front-runner, Scotland captain, take us to the World Cup, maybe a year beyond. And then it's naturally, age takes its hold. So being at a club like Extra, I think, for Hoggy, one's a big move uh, because he's Scotland's best player. He, he has been. And I think he is Scotland's best player and he has been for the last 10 years. He might have been the best Scotland player ever. And to go to Exeter was a big move. Right decision, I think. But Exeter aren't playing that well. They're, they're, they're not. They're not the team that they were a couple of years ago when hockey went. And I suppose that's potentially why your head would be turned. And there's also, when you get to the, in the age of 29, 30, he moved to Exeter. Yes, he would have been big money, marquee, I'm sure, all that. But he would get a, a fortune in France. He'd get a fortune in Japan. And that naturally is going to turn your head. So it's so many a man's head. So I, th- I think that it's at that point now where it's not set in stone. If he said it is, then it is probably for the, for the definitely for the foreseeable future. But he's at that age now where he'll probably need to be thinking about the future and have one eye on that. And that becomes difficult. Then that becomes very different to being 23, 24 years old and the world is literally at your feet. The world is your oyster. But he's a cracking player, as we know. And Exeter was the right move for him. Um, and if he said he stayed, well... I'll go with Hoggy's post, or he's maybe telling someone to come and get him. I'm staying, but come and get me. Yeah, it's maybe a hello, I'm here. Who's out there? What um, though did you think? I mean, did you expect Glasgow to turn Exeter over? And then similarly, what about Edinburgh going down to Saracens recently? I mean, it is so good for Scottish rugby. I did see Glasgow beating Exeter. I tweeted about it. I thought that they would. I don't think Exeter are playing that well. They're playing, they're good, but not the level that they were before. I say that when they won Europe and won the Prem. Yeah. Uh, they just don't look the same team. For whatever reason, it happens. But Glasgow, mate, they, they look brilliant. They look really, really good. And the whole season, some of the results haven't gone their way genuinely, have not gone their way. I'd arguably say, big call. I think Glasgow have got a little bit more than Edinburgh. I don't know what, I don't, I don't know what it is. I don't know whether it's a bit more physicality, I don't know whether they're more well-rounded. I can't put it more. We'll see in a couple of weeks. I mean, Edinburgh looked great. Edinburgh looked great. The thing is with Edinburgh is they do look great and everything's going so well for them. I think they've lost one, drawn one this season. Like you said, they went down to Saracens. Who saw that coming? Like, I mean, Saracens, they didn't go full noise, but they went the Vullapolas, yeah. Maratoji full noise. So they went kind of full noise. And I look at Edinburgh doing that, having commentated on them all season, they look brilliant. Not getting carried away, they look brilliant. They really do. The style of rugby that they're playing under Mike Blair, the profile of players that they've got, you know, Ben Bellicott that looks sensational. But what that's done is push Henry Purgos on, who is playing better than ever. And yeah. then Darcy Graham's fit. You know, you've got some young Scotland players coming through the back row. Marcus Bradbury, uh, Luke Crosby look brilliant. Uh, Jamie Hodgson as well, who got capped, has stepped up. You know, Bo and Venter, Second choice, Lou said, beyond Pierre Schumann looks brilliant. So you, you kind of said it then. Scottish rugby at the minute, when you've got Glasgow beating Exeter at home, the way that Exeter played, they bullied them, uh, had some big wins over the season. Edinburgh, like I just said, lost one, drawn one. They shouldn't have lost away in Italy, but they did. Uh, they drew against the physical South African team, beat Saracens. And you actually look now with what Scotland did in the Six Nations as well. I know we didn't win it. It feels like we did. But... <laughs> the profile of players that we've got now that are filtering through that are Scottish as well, like, you know, Scottish qualified with a little bit of South African stardust and a bit of Fijian stardust as well. It looks really, really good, mate. It really does. And I'd say, John Barkley said, what did he say? Yeah. Once in a generational yeah, team yeah. in Scotland. But I think the future of Scotland rugby now, and it almost feels like it shouldn't be because of COVID. Everything's been stripped back. You know, Glasgow had a load of changes. You know, my mate Kelly Brown left. You know, they've lost, obviously, Finn in recent years, Johnny Gray, Hoggy, Hoggy's gone. You know, Edinburgh lost Duan van der Merwe, you know, the best player in the Scotland team. They lost Cockrell. You're thinking, oh, God, here we go. But actually, 
we look brilliant. As I say, we, like as in Scottish rugby. So fair play. Yeah, fair play. And when, when they combine for the Six Nations and we get this, the team out there, I mean, it's all to play for. And this year, I think it's time to step up for Scotland and get some of these. They've had some big wins of recent, of late. Good games against South Africa, obviously a loss. Australia with a big win. But going anywhere in the Six Nations, we should be comfortable. We should be confident going into all the games. Yeah, no, we should do. Like we, we can, we genuinely can beat anyone. I think the hard one now is, I mean, Ireland against New Zealand just have scared the life out of me. I thought they were on the way down, but I mean, after they beat um, New Zealand, you know, they'd scared the life out of me now because they were phenomenal. But the rest, rest of the teams, I say that France beat New Zealand as well, but we beat France over in Paris, yeah. and they still have that French kind of will they turn it, will they won't. Just naturally, they'll, they'll always have that, but. That's the worry now for Scotland because people know that we're good. So beating England, beating France away, you know, should have beat Wales really if it wasn't for a red card. You know, could have beaten Ireland. Naturally, we're going to beat Italy now. The big thing is, is under the pressure and the autumn series, we didn't play well at all. We actually played quite poorly, to be fair, in terms of what we thought we might see. But that's going to be the worry now. And it's always been the worry. As an underdog... We never performed, but you know that England game that we won. No one thought we were going to win. No fans ended up smashing them. France. It was all about how many points were France going to score. I think they needed twenty-one points, and we, we were like, right, well, if if they only score ten, it's a success, and we beat them. Yeah. So, I think you know you marry that up with the Lions tour as well with the players that we had. You know, Gregor went there, albeit you know the guys didn't play a huge part of that, and also the strength and depth. You know, Rory Dodge coming through at Glasgow. You know, Hamish Watson seems like he's carrying a little bit of a knock. I mentioned the back row at Edinburgh. I didn't even mention Jamie Ritchie, who's obviously vice captain as well. It's, you know, the Six Nations. I just hope there's fans, mate, because well, that's stating the obvious. That's what, what sport's about, isn't it? And we didn't have fans last year, as we know. Didn't feel the same. The Lions tour didn't feel the same. I know the rugby wasn't great, but I still think it would have felt different if there was fans in the stadium, I don't think anyone would have said, oh, that was a crap game. So we just need to get fans there. And then, you know, Scotland with three home games. Really, this is it, I think. You know, if we're going to do something, because I feel like we potentially have reached the ceiling in terms of like how the profile of our players look. I don't know if there's, we had huge room for growth. I don't think there's huge, much more room for growth. It's about putting together and actually winning games and, and trying to win a tournament. So... Yeah, I agree that this is it, really. Um, if not now, then next year going into the World Cup as well. I agree, and we've got Talisman in the right position. I mean, Hoggy leading the, the the whole squad, but let alone the team, the way he performs. Johnny Gray obviously played against Richie um, at the weekend. Did you watch that? Although the, the highlights, everything was all foggy and you couldn't see much, but did you hear any crack off, off the back of that about the brothers playing against each other? They're both quite quiet, to be fair. Yeah. So... It, yeah, I don't think there was much crack. I mean, there was a picture that obviously we saw after with them together. You know, Johnny's gone about his career in a different way to Richie, uh, both quietly, but, you know, Johnny made the right move in terms of wanting to win something. Not that by Richie going to Castor, uh, going to France. Richie didn't like the limelight. Like, I, you know, I was just, I was probably in awe of him, really, when we played together and the profile that he brought to the team. He hated it. Most of us would be lapping it up, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> um, but, look, you know, Richie's a good player. Um, you know, Johnny's flying the flags for the, for the for the Gray family, I feel now. Naturally, he's obviously uh, got more appetite for it. And I say that with the, the utmost kind of respect. That's just is what it is. And Richie's doing his thing at Glasgow. He's back, he's home, he's comfortable. And Johnny, for me, it's about kicking on to the next level. And before his injury, um, he looked like he definitely turned the corner in terms of like stepping up again and he's a quality player so yeah I saw it at the weekend obviously it's nice having them kind of side narrative yeah. isn't it and holding going back to Glasgow Absolutely what about the 1872 Cup you got any good memories any good scraps any good uh, incidents maybe even uh, George Street after the games any good uh, things that sort of you remember of major highlights Oh mate they're good games like they're, we had a chat with Premier Sports to the media people and again it's easy to sit there and say oh out of all the derbies that I played in Leicester Northampton you know Saracens Harlequins or Saracens Northampton Montpellier against Toulon the Edinburgh and Glasgow was actually the one 
like, but it genuinely was. It was the derby match that was the most physical, was the most emotional, uh, that meant the most for a number of reasons. The fact that it kind of bridged over Christmas and New Year, maybe had that slight kind of extra emotion and feel to it. Uh, but I think it was more because of the the two pro teams in Scotland. Obviously, the Scotland coaches would have been watching. You know, they're on TV. They're well supported in terms of where Edinburgh and Glasgow were back then. They didn't have many fans. But when the 1872 Cup was on, uh, the fans turned out because it was yeah. over Christmas and New Year. So it was scrappy doing, mate. That was it. There weren't much rugby. It, 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 from what I remember, you know, me and Barkley were reminiscing. I, I read an article in the Times with Chris Fissaro when he had a fight with Scott in McLeod. Like, I don't remember much rugby. I just remember it was scrappy dude. It was like, <laughs> you know, it was old. It was two foot into a breakdown. It was like cover up. And some of my mates that I didn't think were hard, like Kelly Brown and Barkley, for whatever, the weeks over Christmas were hard. Like, you know, they, they were tough. Like, they could fight. I never knew they could fight. I never saw them fight. But for whatever reason, they had the bit between the teeth in them games. So, fiercely contested. It's obviously a little bit different now. I don't even know who's carrying the mantle of the most wins and losses. Probably need to do my research of the 872 Cups that I'm commentating on. But um, I know it's pretty, like, it, it's it's fairly matched. But you'll, you'll see, mate, it is. And you talk about going down George Street. It's, it's Christmas, mate. <laughs> There's nothing open, I don't think, is there, between Christmas and New Year. <laughs> but, in that, but that's a, a fair point. You're going to be at the Games, obviously, because you're commentating. But I see the game has been moved back to the, the Dam Health Stadium. It was obviously going to be in Murrayfield because there's so many fans, but they're going to play it in the, in the new stadium. Are you enjoying the new stadium? I, I've been quite a few times now. I think it's fantastic for Edinburgh. Oh, mate, game changer. Apart from the pillars or the post or whatever holds, holds up at the front, like they're pretty shocking, but you're never going to get it perfect, are you? But um, that's the, the moan out of the way. That is the only moan, and that's the consensus from some of the fans. But in terms of um, a game changer, it absolutely is. You know, Edinburgh, as you probably know more than me, Nash, is, is a wonderful rugby city. Um, you know, the Six Nations and the romance around that long standing in history, in Scottish history, uh, for way before we were born. And it needs a good team. It needs a good team. And they've got a good team in Edinburgh, but they need a place to go. They need somewhere to go out with Murrayfield. And they're still going to Murrayfield, but they're just going out in the backyard. And having that and the way that it's set up with, you know, the food trucks and you can get a beer and stuff like that. And the, and the kind of intimacy, it's a game changer not only just for the players and the fans, but commercially as well, you know, to be able to bring people to the game and, you know what, I want to be a part of that. Like, how do I get involved? And, you know, the kids are there and they'll be kind of watching and, you know, they'll be watching the game, but they'll be messing around as well. It needs to be an experience. And certainly, as things were getting back to normal in pre-season and then obviously the Scarlets game and the South African teams that came over and the, and the sun was shining and the weather was decent, Mate, it just looked like a different place. It just felt completely different. So, yeah, the get. I mean, in that, you know, I'm kind of spitballing here, but yeah, there's no fans. That's yeah, we, we said that. So it's going to feel very different. Again, I suppose that's part of our job in the commentary team is to kind of bring that energy. And there'll be more people watching at home because they can't be there, uh, which is a real shame. Um, I don't know how that look how that looks commercially for rugby. It's obviously going to unfold isn't it and hopefully it is for this two three week circuit break or whatever they're saying but you know the games hopefully will still be good they'll be fiercely yeah. contested just feels different without fans do you know what I mean it just it just does like as a yeah. player I imagine I imagine it does but it's our job anyway in the commentary team I'm, I'm, I'm with John Barkley uh, to kind of bring that energy and, and the fact that we're there is great the fact that I'm still working and been able to do my job it's brilliant. You know, I can't complain about that. So uh, I'm still looking forward to it, is what I'm saying. We could talk rugby all night. I want to take you away from rugby because obviously following your Twitter and the, knowing you personally, there's sort of other things you're interested in. There's a lot going on in the fighting game at the moment when we talk UFC, but we also talk Jake Paul and boxing. How are you enjoying what sort of what's happening? Jake Paul sort of taking over the boxing game and all these sorts of things. Well, UFC and boxing, in that order, are my two favourite sports. Like, I never do them. I mean, they're barbaric. Do you know what I mean? In terms of, like, rugby's tough enough. But, they, I mean, they're just, like, a, it's a phenomenal sport. I don't know, 
yeah, you talk about exceptional human beings. You've you've got to be well. A lot of them are mad. You've got to be an exceptional human being to kind of get into that space. And I say that from a an athlete perspective, having been an athlete in a team and the pressures that come with that. And uh, you look at Jake Paul. It's almost like it's been a comedy sketch in the lead up to it, and no one wants him to do well, me included, because it's like, mate, you're a YouTuber. Do you know what I mean? You're on Disney TV. What do you know about boxing? What do you know about fighting? I don't know anything. Like, I just watch it. Do you know what I mean? But I'm yeah. looking at guys that have kind of been through the mill. And he had the fight in the weekend against Tyron Woodley, who I followed in UFC for probably the last eight years. I've been watching it properly. And all I'm thinking is that it's a fix. I'm like, how, how has this guy been KO'd by YouTube? I'm not convinced, Nashi, at the minute. Yeah. I want to be. And it's complete respect for him. Like we're, you know, yourself, me, other people, you know, we're all trying to do our thing. We're all trying to build up whatever we want to do and build the profile with that. And with that comes the ability to fall. You know, but Jake Paul hasn't yet. And it shows you the new era and the new age that we're in. It's around social media. It's around building profile. It's around shit talk. It's around these things that we don't... That's the thing with the Jake Paul thing. It's not like... He's doing it the wrong way, but the right way. He's doing it the wrong way in terms of like the social media, the trash talk, the stuff that we don't really like, but it's the right way because it works. Like that's what works at the minute. And that's what sells. And as soon as I woke up, I didn't, I didn't stay up and watch the fight. It wasn't like Tyson Fury, Deontay Wilder. But as soon as I woke up, I thought about it. And I clicked on it. I was like, what's happened? I saw Woodley got KO'd. I'm like, then I saw it. I was like, well, this is the fix. Tommy Fury hammering, I, in my opinion. And, and until he fights Tommy Fury, he fights a boxer. He needs to fight Tommy Fury, in my opinion. Then I won't be convinced. Uh, I'm not. If he beats Tommy Fury, I'll be like, mate, this guy's a real deal. And I will follow him and I'll be a fan of his. I'm a fan of his. I like people who do well. But it's just in terms of the, the old school narrative of, of, of combat sports. He's just... He's current. He's so current, and he's found his way to the, almost the top. I mean, he he can name his price. He he sets the price. He pays the fighters. You know, he's putting a lot of his own cash up. There's tons of sponsorships, but like you say, coming through YouTube, I think it's like 14 months or four fight. Whatever he's done, he's done it so quickly. When you look at someone like Canelo or the the real sort of the greats of boxing came through the dark days. You know, they came through the sweaty gyms and the the, the no money. Whereas he's come with money. And then there's his brother who's about to fight Mike Tyson. You know, I mean, these guys are coming through a different route, but it's modern, isn't it? It's modern. They found the quick way to get to the top. Content, mate. That's what it is. You know, this snapshot content, trash talk. Maybe that's what we need to start doing. We start trash talking everyone, <laughs> and, you know, make a name for ourselves. But yeah, you're right, mate. That's it's the way of the world now, isn't it? And you know, I'm a fan. Like, I, I love the sport. And I, what I do love around that, I'll probably contradict myself, I do like the drama around it. Like that's, I, I think the build-up, I think the way I, I tweeted about it today around the build-up to the heavyweight title with Cyril Garn and uh, Francis Ngannou for the UFC heavyweight title. Look at the content. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, uh, but the thing is with the UFC is the fights normally marry up with the content. You know, boxing doesn't always happen. Like sometimes the build-up can be unbelievable and the fights aren't great. But, you're talking about two of the most ultimate combative sports in terms of re mental resilience, physical resilience, and bloody long-term trauma to the body. Do you follow Dana White and his story and just sort of what he's come through and how he's got to where he is? Sort of billionaire several times over, selling the company, building it, but just staying so current and just being there in the fight game. It's it's awesome to watch him operate in the way that he he, he just builds a brand and he's a marketing machine. Yeah, obviously another special human being uh, in terms of work ethic. Clearly a smart guy. Uh, taking risks as well. Took a risk during the pandemic to move it to Abu Dhabi. Yeah. Um, took a risk with content. You know, it's pretty strict with his fighters in terms of I'm, I'm going to pay you X. I'm not going to pay you anything more than that. This is how it looks. And just understands understands what business looks like. He's a smart, significantly smarter guy than I'll ever be, but yeah, I mean, the proof's in the pudding. And you look at the brand in terms of what he's built, you know, it was an octagon. It was like no holes barred. You can grab the nuts, you can do the headbutt, you can do all them things to now he's built. Well, we're talking about it here on the other side of the world and we don't, we know nothing about it. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and we're enjoying it. Have you ever watched the bare knuckle? That seems to have had a bit of resurgence of bare knuckle fighting. 
that's that's extreme. The cuts that they get and the the, the brutality is just it's horrific, to be honest. Madness, mate. I watched the I watched these two women going at it as well, like like absolutely smashing the life out of each other. It was just again they're trying to top it, aren't they? It's almost like the UFC at, at, at the at the level now. You then you've got Bellator and, and someone's trying to change the narrative. It's almost like you can't change something that's that's going so well. You can try and compete, but yeah, I mean, bare, bare knuckle. What's happening with that Nash is is you've got the people who need a bit of money. And they're at the end of their careers or whatever, and the UFC won't take them, Bellator won't take them. But you know what? Get the fucking gloves off. Here we go. Let's just take it bare knuckle, and then that's the end of you. So it's brutal. Yeah, we'll, get your, we'll get your Bruce Ancientson doing that for Doddy, mate. Get the two podcasters <laughs> quite scrapping it out. Have a bare knuckle. <laughs> Have a bare knuckle. Celebrity match. Um, I saw Bruce recently was jumping in the sea and all that. I need to get him along to my bit. Um, he was doing his cold water stuff. But that, again, let's get it back to Doddy because guys like Bruce and people that are stepping up, as you say, it's it's just it's a it's a hard thing to say that it's great to be involved because we know we're doing it because Doddy and so many people are are, are not well with MND. But just being in this community for Doddy Aid and getting new people along all the time when they see the momentum of how it just keeps rolling and rolling and social media, something new comes up or some new celebrity or some big name gets involved. Remember last year, Gerard Butler, Ewan McGregor, all these people saying, come on. So it's sitting wondering, are they going to bring in some Hollywood names, some people this year? What, what's going to happen? Who's around the corner and all these sorts of things. It's so cool. Of the, the, the way people just combine to make this an epic month that we're just about to enter. Yeah, I saw Rob Burrow as well last year. I think Ricky Gervais gave him a shout out as well. Um, which again just shows it does touch people out of outside of our ring. Do you know what I mean? I know yeah. our ring has got pretty big now with the people involved in this, but I think, yeah, just going back to kind of what I said earlier last year, I think that there'll be a number of different reasons why people are doing this. Like people who, you know, kids that don't understand MND. I probably never will. They'll never be affected, never be touched by it. People who don't know Doddy, uh, they'll have heard of him. But nonetheless, doing something like this will have huge benefits for them in terms of the sense of community, the sense of work, the sense of purpose, whether or not it's being active or raising money. I think everyone in the foundation, in the My Name's Doddy Foundation, they can deal with the money. They can deal with how things look in terms of the finances and the administration that goes with it. And then there'll be another level of people that, like myself, like yourself, who want to go out there and try and bring more people into the community, which we know will then help raise more money and raise more profile. And we've got quite a nice role to play in that. And then you have people on the outside and then people that I've just mentioned, the people that just want to come because it's going to be fun. They're a part of something. You know, they've watched the documentary. They've, they've heard the story of Doddy. They've been touched by Doddy, and that's the power probably of of this foundation and, and what we see here. And yeah, you know, I think we've all seen the changes in Doddy naturally the last the last year, and it's sad, like it really is. And and, and it's and, and it's tough. It, it's tough to watch it unfold because I think there was a, at the start of it. I think you know this is just my perspective and my story. You know, I've got huge admiration for Doddy you know, way before this because of the way that he played and how he transitioned out of the game and probably quite similar to the way that I have in terms of speaking and not taking myself too seriously, that self-deprecation. It's a huge admiration. I think for me, there was a little bit of like seeing him when we were in Hong Kong, when it just kind of got announced that, well, there's, well yeah, like actually he, he looks fine. Like he looks like there's nothing going on. And then actually just slowly as my life carries on as normal, watching Doddy's decline alongside Rob Burrow and everything that's going on. And that's where it kind of hits home. Do you know what I mean? When you actually like, it is something tangible here and the reason why we are doing it. And we mentioned the people on that kind of outer exterior that will join um, the Doddy aid over January into February, which will be great. But the large part of it will be to raise money. And we know that the government now fronted up 50 million. And that's because of, my name's Doddy. And that's because of Rob Burrow. The fact that the, the profile and the momentum and the celebrity status and the unbelievable challenges that people have done has kind of made them think, actually, and it grates me that these people up there have 
access and it's kind of there saying where the money goes but again you know, that's just it's like anything isn't it but I think we're now at a stage now where there seems to be some real money going into the direction of finding a cure for this I, I know nothing about it I knew nothing about it I spent some time with Scott Hastings in Italy uh, over three weeks during the autumn and, and learning more about it and, and, and the kind of stuff that people are going through and it's uh, and it's sad and it's real and, it, and it's and it's close uh, so, you know, for me to be a part of it in the way that I am is, is a huge privilege. It's an honour. Um, it, it's good for me. It's good for the family. You know, my my parents down south, my mum, my mum's involved in it as well. And she's like, oh, um, I had no idea. And, you know, I'm going to try and raise a bit of money. It'll be 100 quid, 200 quid. 100 quid, 200 quid. It goes into the pot. And yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, it, it's class to be a part of. And I'm sure that it's going to be a really hard but fulfilling kind of four to six to eight weeks yeah and as we, as we find out more and more about Dory's condition I mean the images of remember when he walked out with his boys uh, the All Blacks game that'll, that'll never leave me you know when he's such an, an icon of Scottish rugby and what he was he was he was walking on there he was waving he shook the hands and Kieran Reid in, in Barclay and you know even then you're looking thinking he's He's, he's all right at the moment. He's all right at the moment. And then we do see the decline. And we see him now talking with um, Rob Wainwright on social media videos and things like that. And it just hits home, you know, that what he's going through, what his family have had to adapt to and what the what we can all do to try and help. And that all starts on January 1st, you know. So the Barbarians, you got a rallying call as team manager. We're going to get Gabby on this podcast. I'm trying to organise that. Kenny's coming on. Who else have I got lined up? I've got Sean Fitzpatrick. As an honorary barbarian, he's coming on. Sir John Kerwin, the old black legend. So we've got some rugby people from around the world. Who else do you fancy, Jim? Who else? Who, who else should we get on this pod? Oh, mate, I'm sort of trying to think. You put me on the spot. Who do you want? What well, do you think? Well, there's, there's a bit of chat between uh, a bit of back and forth between you and Austin Healy on the, the old WhatsApp group. Would Austin come on and chat mate, about Austin's, Austin to play? If you can get Austin, I tell you what, mate, you give one. Is all I'm saying. <laughs> I can't, I, I, he, won't, he wouldn't even stop in the street and chat to me. I've known Austin since I was 17. So, mate, if you get Austin, I tell you now you've made it. So I'll, I'll call him out on the WhatsApp group because uh, even just to hear about the 97 Lions with, with Doddy and all that sort of stuff, that would be pretty cool yeah. to get some of Austin's memories. Um, but we, yeah, yeah we'll need, absolutely. We'll need, who's the cyclist? Nico. We need to check out Nico. The, it's the, a, I don't think he's a dancer, is he? Oh, is he? No, no, he's just. I don't know. I, I, no, he's a cyclist. I think he's on a dancing show at the moment. He's oh, that's right. Okay, so it is Nico the cyclist. I was getting like, there's so many messages on there. It's kind of like they come through at, at half six, seven. I'll go through it. Yeah, so it is Nico the, the cyclist who's doing the dancing. He's doing the dancing. He's, he looks like an interesting character. So there's tons going on. And this is just the Barbarians podcast that I'll be hosting. But everyone else, check out the Edinburgh show. What have we got? North and Midlands, I think, has got one. Glasgow's got one. There, there's going to be shows, shows. There's going to be content. And then the massive day, January 29th, we've got World in a Day, where I'm sort of in the background at the moment with Mark Beaumont working out the schedule. You remember last year, Jim, you came on. It was brilliant when you guys were all on, all the captains. But the aim is to try and cover 240 miles in a day what Mark Beaumont did each day when he broke the world record going around the world on his bike. So throughout the day, people can join in at any time. You can be on your bike, you can be on your rowing machine, you can come on, and throughout the day, I'll be hosting it. it starts at the crack of dawn, we go on until, until everyone's finished, basically. But throughout the day, you'll be there, Jim, um, and we're working on some pretty big names for, for me to chat with throughout the day, but there'll be lots of stuff going on on that day, and that's the world in a day on January the 29th. But Jim, it's, it's shaping up to be a pretty exciting month. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the people that are involved in the background, we're obviously, like I said, we've got a WhatsApp chat that's pinging left, right and centre. Rob Wainwright's asking me what pigs are these and what sheep are these. And I'm like, Man, I, ain't, I ain't got a clue. Like, I'm not a farmer as much as I want to be and probably look like one. So, yeah, there's lots going on. Obviously, we start on January the 1st with um, some water action. Isn't that right, Nashi? What? In, like the Looney Duke? The Looney Duke. That's what Looney we're doing, Duke. yeah. Yeah, where are we going for that? So we're, start, we're starting off on January 1st, the Looney Duke. I don't know. I was thinking, I've got a perforated eardrum, not to make an excuse. I'm going in, but I don't know if I'm going full head. If I do, if you see me with earplugs somewhere, you'll know why. But it starts on January 1st, yeah, like you said, with the Looney Duke. And yeah, I think now it's just kind of building the hysteria, building the admin, the, the snoods around. You now I've got the barbarian snood. 
I'm not one of these. It's like everyone wants to be a barbarian, right? Whether or not they say they do or they don't. One, it sounds really cool. Secondly, it was class to play for the barbarians. It's almost like the best of the best come together from wherever you're from. So I don't need to sell it that much. That's what I feel. I feel like people want to do it. Like, they'll be, of course, like North and Mids, they've got Lorraine Kelly, so they've got some star pulling power. Ours will just speak for itself. Like, when, when it comes to it, we'll have a very strong team. Uh, the snooze look cracking. And we've got some phenomenal people and people that can rack up the miles. You mentioned Austin Healy there. Hell of a cyclist. Nico, well, he is a cyclist. I don't think Kenny Logan's got off for much, to be honest with you, apart from a bit of <laughs> shit banter. But um, nonetheless, you know, he's there because of Gabby, uh, who brings the profile. And uh, yeah, look, it's going to be really good fun. And let's just see if we can top. I don't know what it finished up on last year in terms of how much we raised, but it was well over a million, wasn't it? So, yeah, it's pushing 1.2. Um, yeah, I think there was a bit rolling in. But it's yeah. probably still rolling in now um, with some of the kind of the old links that are out there. But yeah. It's um, it's going to be great. It's going to go on for four, six weeks. Stay in the whole time if you want. Dip in, dip out. But January 1st, the Looney Duke and for the Barbarians that aren't Scottish, it basically means just get into a bit of water on January 1st. That's that's you cold baptizing water. yourself. Cold water. Yeah, cold water. I mean, yeah, it can be cold water in the bath. I don't know some of the Barbarians listeners whether they've got access. To the, if they live in Coventry, where well, there's a canal, but I wouldn't advise going in there. <laughs> But it's um, that's the start of it. That's you basically ringing the bell, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. The minute you hit cold water on January 1st, it's you ringing the bell to say, I'm here, I'm starting, and I'm a bloody barbarian. So, cannot that's wait. It, that's it, folks. You heard it from Big Jim. Jim, awesome. We've gone, uh, we've gone, where are we? Almost an hour now. So, Jim, thank you for joining me. Appreciate it, bud. Um, it's going to be an exciting month we've got stacks going on Jason Fox he'll hopefully bring in a couple of his pals that would be quite quite good chat for the big day he's going to be joining us on the 29th of January he's on tour but he'll be uh, nipping in uh, and there are some really big names Hoggy will be there on the day Scotland captain he'll be giving us a bit of chat pre the Six Nations um, but I won't I won't elaborate on who else at the moment I think that'll be down to Mark Beaumont in due course but there's tons going on Jim this has been awesome covered a lot Good luck with Christmas and getting there with the kids and not losing the rag, but Santa's on his way. Santa's on his way and I need the luck. Cheers, Nashi. All right, mate. All the best.